Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about mechanism of beta cell dysfunction in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, you know, we always learn a lot from our animal models, right? And what have we learned from our animal model of diabetes? Uh, let me take a step back. What's the difference between a pre-diabetic and a patient with type 2 diabetes? The difference really lies between the, in the function of the beta cell, right? A pre-diabetic is perhaps as insulin resistant as a type 2 diabetic, but a type 2 diabetic, the beta cell does not function as well as a, as a patient with pre-diabetes. So this is what we have learned from our animal models. So what they do when they create models for type 2 diabetes, animal models, they remove uh, certain hypothalamic regions of these mice, and these mice are given unlimited food. So it's like this, right? There is unlimited food for you, and you have absolutely no satiety. So you can eat as much, as much as you want. The mouse keeps gaining weight. And then what happens, right? The interesting thing is that the mice keep gaining weight, keep becoming more and more and more insulin resistant. But some mice develop diabetes, whereas others do not, right? So what's the difference between a mice who develops diabetes versus a mice which does not? But the mice who develops diabetes has poor beta cell function. At some point of time, the beta cell function is not able to catch up with the insulin resistance, and that is type 2 diabetes. And that is exactly what happens in patients with type 2 diabetes in clinical practice. So in obesity increases insulin resistance, or any other factor increases insulin resistance, but if the insulin production is not able to match up with the insulin resistance, that is when diabetes develops. Let me put a corollary to you. There are a lot of patients who have who are obese, but they're not diabetic. And there are a lot of patients who are not obese, and yet they're diabetic, right? So if obesity alone or insulin resistance alone led to diabetes, every obese person should be diabetic, but that's not the case. Secondly, let me tell you another interesting thing, right? And we'll come to this point in a minute, right? So this is this, uh, sort of a summary of how patients actually develop diabetes. And we know that insulin resistance keeps increasing but reaches a static point at a period of time. But what changes over a period of time is the beta cell function and the insulin levels. So initially, the body compensates by increasing the insulin production. But at some point of time, where you have the cutoff, where the patient, the, the patient stops, the beta cell stops working to the level it should, and that is when the downhill effect occurs, and that is when the patient develops diabetes. And then it continues to progress over a period of time. So at the time of diagnosis, 50% of the patient, uh, the patient has lost 50% of the beta cell function, and they keep losing about 4 to 5% perc uh, percent of the beta cell function every year. But the key question is, and this is the key point of today's discussion, and if you get this point, I think it's a job well done for me. The debate which is there in today's era of, as far as understanding of pathophysiology of diabetes is concerned, is that are we dealing with reduction of beta cell mass or are we dealing with a reduction of beta cell function? This is the key question, right? Does the beta cell reduce in number or does it become less functional? That's a key difference. Why this debate is important, right? There are arguments on debate on both the sides. You know, if you talk about beta cell mass, and this is another very interesting paradox that you see, there are a lot of patients who undergo pancreatectomy, right? Partial pancreatectomy. Some parts of pancreas have been removed, yet they do not develop diabetes, right? So the beta cell mass has been surgically reduced, yet they do not develop diabetes. Yet there are patients who are obese who have increased beta cell mass, but they have diabetes. So what the debate which is of the two, which is winning, the side which is winning is actually beta cell function. So more and more we are realizing that it is not just the beta cell mass which is resulting in diabetes, it is probably a dysfunction in beta cell which is the problem. And why this debate is important in today's era? In today's world we are talking about diabetes remission. And when I say that the beta cell mass is reduced, that means it is somewhat permanent, right? Generally, you know, if the cells die, they're not going to be resurrected. Right? Well, they might be, we'll see, but generally they're not. But if a beta cell stops functioning as well as it is, probably you can kick it and maybe it'll start functioning better. So when I'm talking about a potentiality of diabetes remission, 
it is better to believe that beta cell function is the one which is causing diabetes and not the mass. And if the beta cell function can be restored, perhaps you can improve the outcome in diabetic patients. So this is why it is very, very important to understand the debate that if I'm saying that the beta cell mass is lost, that is perhaps permanent. And that means that there is perhaps nothing like a diabetes remission in true sense. Whereas if the problem is in beta cell function, perhaps there is a potentiality of diabetes remission. And that is what, you know, recent trials like direct trial has shown. So why does the beta cell impairment occur in type 2 diabetes? Why does it occur? That's the, you know, and that, that's the, uh, you know, key point of the talk today. What is the mechanism? What leads to the beta cell dysfunction? There are three key things, right? And this is a very interesting, uh, art, you know, uh, taken from a very interesting article, uh, which are the models for beta cell impairment or beta cell, uh, you know, uh, dysfunction in patients with diabetes. So there are three major reasons. One is, of course, we discuss reduction in beta cell mass. We'll discuss this. The second key point, that is what, again, we are going to discuss is the beta cell dysfunction. And the third and the emerging concept is that there is trans differentiation of beta cells, right? Beta cells change into alpha cells or perhaps, uh, you know, uh, other pancreatic cells. And that is also perhaps leading to a problem in these patients, right? Why this is important? Because today's talk, today's pathophysiology talk will perhaps be an option for treatment tomorrow, right? Today's understanding of pathophysiology is tomorrow's treatment. And that is what we is really important. So the first model which we talked about is the reduction in beta cell mass. And you know, what are the reasons for that? Now, if you go back right from the beginning, there are a lot of people who say that people have, especially Indians, have you know low beta cell mass to begin with. That is fetal programming, you know, Barker's hypothesis, you know, Dr. Yajnik's uh, things, right? The second is perhaps the beta cell undergoes apoptosis over a period of time, and perhaps aging itself leads to decrease in beta cell mass. So there is genuine reason that there could be reduction in beta cell right uh, mass as well you know about Barker's hypothesis we know that you know perhaps there are epigenetic changes which occur in utero and because of this there are certain genes which get switched off and we are born unfortunately with a smaller beta cell mass that puts us at a risk of developing diabetes in future the second model is the key one which gives us a hope right that there are some factors which lead to damage or beta cell dysfunction and there are two major reasons which have you know which causes this one is what is known as endoplasmic reticulum stress, and second is what is known as oxidative stress. I'll discuss each of this. So what is endoplasmic reticular stress, or ER stress? See, endoplasmic reticulum is given a task that it has to maintain a normal structure of the proteins, right? Now, we know that protein has a primary, secondary, tertiary, and a quaternary structure. And insulin is a very complex protein, which has a very good quaternary structure, right? Now. When a protein is formed, if this protein is not perfectly formed, the endoplasmic reticulum will, you know, destroy it. So when you have a lot of malformed protein accumulating into the endoplasmic reticulum, this produces a situation of ER stress. And in this situation, the cells take a critical decision. I have a lot of garbage in my neighborhood, right? Now, there are two things I can do. Either I can clean my neighborhood or I can close it down. I have a lot of COVID cases in my neighborhood. Either I can treat those COVID cases or I can you know, put a shutdown, right, or lockdown. So in a lot of times, the body tries to respond by improving the, by cleaning the system. But in a lot of times when it is going beyond that particular system, the cells start undergoing apoptosis. And this happens not only in pancreatic beta cells, it occurs in many, many cells of the body. And that is very, very important. Second is the oxidative stress and beta cell dysfunction. Where have we seen this? We see this in patients who are having glucotoxicity. We have all seen, you know, we see a patient who comes with blood sugar of 500. You start this patient on insulin, the blood sugar comes down, the patient's, you know, endogenous insulin production improves, the C-peptide improves. Why does it happen? This happens because there is a system in our body where you have a chronic hyperglycemic state. It leads to increased reactive oxygen species, which stuns the pancreatic beta cells. The beta cells are not able to produce more insulin. This produces a vicious cycle, right? When the beta cell is turned, there is no insulin, less insulin, less insulin means more blood sugar, more blood sugar means more reactive oxygen species, right? So when you break the system by giving insulin or by, by you know, intensive management patient early on, you reduce the oxidative stress, improving the beta cell function. Again, this has very key importance in future in terms of pathogenetic treatment. The third model is, of course, trans differentiation of beta cells. Beta cells start behaving like alpha cells. There is change in the nature of beta cells. 
this is still an emerging area of pathogenesis. We do not understand that. But somewhere, perhaps 10 years from now, if we come back at Diabetes India Conference, hopefully at the same venue, perhaps we'll have some drug which prevents the uh, beta cells from converting to alpha cells and perhaps going back to beta cell function. So of all these three models, the most important model is actually the model two, the beta cell dysfunction, because at this point of time, that is the one which we can really treat and we can really help. Okay, so we had this debate on function versus mass, and at this point of time, there is nothing much we can do about the poor beta cell mass, but we can do a lot about the beta cell function, and that is what really should be, we are looking at in terms of emerging treatment. So, what is the clinical importance of what we have learned today, right? So, few things. One is we have all seen this variant of Indian diabetes patient known as Indian Flatbush variant, right? Uh, Dr. Sujit Jha, uh, you know, unfortunately, passed away a few weeks back. You know, uh, with all due respect to him, this is a beautiful article written by him. It was published in Diabetes Care, where he identified patients where, you know, which was first identified in Flatbush, which is a region in Brooklyn, right? These patients come with severe hyperglycemia, obese patients coming with severe hyperglycemia. And when you treat this patient, they come with ketosis. When you treat this patient with insulin, suddenly they, after a few weeks, the insulin requirement goes away, they go into remission, right? This is a classical example of oxidative stress causing beta cell dysfunction, which is reversible. Of course, we have the key point is diabetes prevention also. This is a very important point. You know, this is an article by Ralph Defronzo on why preservation of beta cell is key to diabetes prevention. I think this is more and more uh, knowledge on this topic really has to be a uh, thing. And of course, we have Dr. Arvind Gupta. I saw him in the morning today. You know, uh, this, this very nice article published in API, uh, you know, which was beta cell preservation in type 2 diabetes, where they talk about the various strategies we can use to preserve the beta cell. You know, these are some of the strategies early intensive glycemic treatment, early initiation of insulin therapy, perhaps, you know, using of certain agents which have ability to preserve the beta cell like your, uh, you know, uh, metformin or DPP-4 inhibitors and so on. So, again, one very important message, you know, this is an area of debate. I don't want to get into the debate of this, but a lot of times, you know, there has always been a suspicion that sulfonylurea perhaps hasten the process of beta cell dysfunction, right, uh, or perhaps lead to more permanent issues right, whereas other drugs do not, and this is a very old study, uh, you know, uh, old sort of meta-analysis where they looked at this article and they found that actually gliburide, uh, you know, uh, led to, over a period of time, these patients on gliburide or sulfonylureas had poor beta cell reserve compared to those patients who were on metformin or rosiglitazone for that matter, right. And then we all have seen this short-term intensive insulin therapy, it has become less popular now, but you know, you had, uh, I, I remember reading articles uh, of, of uh, the senior Dr. Sahai on this, you know, uh, very interesting area of short-term intensive insulin therapy. A patient comes to you, young patient, you know, you start them on insulin, uh, you know, basal bolus insulin, and after a few weeks, you know, the insulin requirement goes away, the patient then goes into remission and then maintains remission for a period of time. So what I'm trying to tell you is that all these are examples of beta cell dysfunction which are reversible, right? I think we need to recognize this important entity and perhaps help our patient in that way. So to summarize and some important take-home message, First important message for all of us is that beta cell impairment, right, is the key to pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Please understand this. There are a lot of tech people I saw, you know, I met a lot of them today. They're working on, you know, exercise and lifestyle and all that. But you have to remember that there is a difference between a pre-diabetic patient and a diabetic patient. A pre-diabetic patient is insulin resistant. A diabetic patient, type 2 diabetes patient is insulin resistant and having beta cell dysfunction. And this is very important, right? And this is where doctors continue to be important. Right? The second important message is that insulin secretion is equal to, it's a function of beta cell mass and beta cell function, right? Of these, which is more important is an area of active debate, but as of now, we would really like to believe that it's a beta cell function, which is more important, perhaps that is why it is more in terms, rem, you know, remission is more likely. And current thinking is more towards beta cell mass function than mass. Uh, preservation of beta cell should be very important, right? It's a key important thing in pathogenesis of preventing uh, or progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes and also key in preventing the progression of diabetes in patients with pre-existing diabetes, right? So, these are the take-home messages, right? We have this app, you know, just for anybody who's interested in this topic, it's called Notes in Endocrinology app, right? So, uh, you know, we made some very good notes, it's a freely available app, right? And we made a, you know, uh, interesting app recently called the Centurion Insulin app. It's 100 years since insulin use. And this app is intended for doctors to really, you know, see which patients are the right candidates for initiating insulin in type 2 diabetes patient, right? So, it's again, freely available. You can search on either your Android or your uh, Google Play Store uh, for Centurion Insulin app. It's freely available and you can, you know, try putting some patients here. You'll see uh, some good results, right? So, 
Thank you for a patient listening. And